Back in 1997, legendary director Steven Spielberg charted a new course for video games when he met with a team from DreamWorks Interactive. Spielberg actually has had a very strong influence, particularly from the beginning. He was actually the spark of Medal of Honor, and he was like, I'm working on this movie called Private Ryan, and I've been playing Goldeneye a lot. So, you know, why don't you guys do War to Goldeneye? And, you know, it started from there. That was the beginning of the wildly successful game called Medal of Honor. Since then, the team has produced three games in the series. Now, working under the umbrella of Electronic Arts, they've finished the first PlayStation 2 title in the series, Medal of Honor Frontline. Basically, the complete scope of Medal of Honor Frontline is one complete storyline, and it takes place between the third and fourth mission of the original Medal of Honor. You resume the role of Jimmy Patterson, and the general goal, I guess you could say, of Frontline is you will steal a prototype jet known as the Ho-9 fighter. One of the keys to the success of the Medal of Honor series has been its amazing realism. That even applies to the storylines. The Ho-9 was an amazing piece of machinery that was completely out of the league of anything else that was there. It was potentially a weapon that could have turned the tide of the war. And it's basically a flying wing. It looks like a stealth bomber. You'd be surprised at some of the technology that came out of World War II that just seems so far-fetched. While our scenario on Frontline is fictitious, it actually was captured at the end of the war and is now seeing restoration so that it can be included in the Smithsonian exhibit. In addition to the Ho-9, every detail in Medal of Honor Frontline is meticulously researched. I think that people definitely get a feel for what it was like to fight in those locations. We do an extensive amount of research, both here on site through video and book, and normal research means. God love the internet. We just went through the internet and just like just kept typing in various things we were looking for. And there's a lot of enthusiasts out there who collect authentic items, and they'd have these photographs that just gave us a, a huge wealth of reference material that we can look at and say, oh, that's what it should look like when it's not new, but weathered and worn. We wanted to give them a little bit of like grit to them. Watching movies, we get ideas, like the whole Nijmegen Bridge scenario is loosely based off of some stuff from A Bridge Too Far. There's a team of climbers who are rogues who go around and illegally climb structures and take pictures of it during their escapades, so the pictures that he took while he was doing this were really important to me because they're from the undercarriage of the bridge where no pictures are of any of the detail under there, and a lot of the gameplay in this level takes place underneath the bridge, so I needed really good reference. Jimmy is dropped into Holland with two other comrades. That whole environment in the Dutch pasture is based on a trip that my art director took to Holland. And he visited a number of museums and took over 1,200 photographs. And they ranged from the architecture to signage to cobblestone road textures to all sorts of material that once he brings back, our artists can put to use in terms of their textures, our designers can put to use in terms of what's a really interesting building. These textures look awesome. Yeah. <laughs> But this is on my idea. Yeah, he looks... Another way the Medal of Honor team immerses you in the game is by working hard to give each character a unique look. In terms of enemies in Frontline, we run the gamut. We have over 300 different variations of characters in the game. So our goal is that every time you see an enemy, in any given level, they will be different from the other enemies you will see. We've got certain technology that we're using where we will swap meshes between characters and heads between characters and the textures will be different and the characters will be different in terms of what they're wearing and what their pack is in terms of what equipment they're carrying and so on and so forth. We've got guys in boxer shorts running around, we've got guys in bathrobes and smoking jackets and then we tried to see how many ways we can combine the various pieces and come up with even newer pieces out of that so we went for as many different individual characters as we could per level. In creating so many unique looks, the team found inspiration from many different places. One of our character designers in designing the faces and the face textures actually designed maquettes and he sculpted these heads. He would take these designs, sculpt them out with a flesh-colored clay and light it and then photograph it and use that as the base. And then from there, once it's mapped on and he's satisfied with the way it works on the three-dimensional mesh, he would go through it and start doing painting on top of it. He would paint in details and things like that. To add a little bit more realism, we actually would photograph various people around the building. Use that for some of the variations in the textures. You know, it's funny, I keep thinking that I'm seeing 
various people around the building in the game. I think our lead sound guy is throughout the game. Our marketing director, I think, is in the game at certain places. And sometimes, you know, if you're having a bad day with that particular person, you go to the game and just start firing away at them. It's really good therapy sometimes, but, uh, but don't tell them that. Not only are some of the enemies varied, but some of them actually change throughout the game. There's a chef or a cook that shows up in about four levels. He's just cool because he looks mean. And we put him through his paces through the game, not just with gameplay, but each time you see him, there's a little bit more damage on him, wear and tear on his costuming, just because we thought, hey, you know, we don't have to reuse the assets from the first time we see him. We can actually give him a torn shirt. We can put a burn flash on his apron. We can give him a black eye. We can do all these things. Unlike many current games, there's no motion capture used in the Medal of Honor series. We made a decision not to use motion capture again in the very first game, and that kind of defined our Medal of Honor tradition. We key animate everything, we hand animate everything, and it's something we take a lot of pride in as well. We do a lot of acting out things. We are constantly seen running around in the hallways with video cameras and with weapons. In fact, we try to be careful if there's a door because people outside could see these guys running around with Tommy guns and all that. In fact, we try to even get a bazooka, but uh, somehow they wouldn't let us have it. I still don't understand why. And the reason is we, just, we get into the skin of the characters. The, all the animators do that. One thing that I pride myself about the way animations are done for Medal of Honor is we use what's called a state-based system of animation. And the whole point is that we animate not just looping animations, but we animate entire mental states. And the cool thing is that you'll see different performances by the same character when played different times. So it's always organic. We don't have the same loop, loop, loop action going on because that's one of the things that totally kills um, animation in games. Perhaps the area where the animation can be seen most is the pub scene. And in Frontline there's a scene where you infiltrate a Nazi pub and there are about 20 Nazis in there. And there's about four or five guys playing cards at the table, there's a couple guys at the bar, there's a couple guards back at the door, there's another table of guys chatting to the side and then there's a piano player. You can't get past the guards at the stairs until you do a little something to get the piano guy to play a little tune and you get all the guys singing and then you can head off to the back of the pub where there's another distraction you cause back there but you're all weaponless at this point. And so there's a little bit of a puzzle there. In your race to capture the Ho-9, you find that you have an enemy who stands above the rest. We're introducing a character named Albrecht von Sturmgeist, and he is the big baddie of the game, and he's the man in charge of the Ho-9's production. And so one of the first things Jimmy is told to do is to track this guy down, and we want him to be a compelling character who's pretty bad and eludes you pretty much till the end of the game. In gameplay, we want to make him feel more like you're equal and not like He's so hard that he'll take a bazooka shot to the head, and we really want to get that idea that he's more crafty than he is just, you know, some super badass. <laughs> you're definitely going to have to use both your brains and your arsenal if you're going to help Jimmy Patterson steal the Ho-9 in Medal of Honor Frontline.